Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is going to be a really fun episode with my friend Randy Ulmer. And I was able to do the interview live at Randy's house in uh, Cave Creek, Arizona. We just had a great time. Randy brings a lot of value uh, to this podcast. I know you guys are going to love it. Uh, Randy was inducted into the Bow Hunter Hall of Fame in 1999. He really n- needs no introduction. He's probably the best uh, bow hunter uh, on the planet. He's killed probably the, the biggest trophies in, in many, many categories, uh, especially mule deer and elk uh, of, of, of anybody out there. Uh, mule deer, uh, archery mule deer is his bread and butter, and we're going to talk about uh, that on this podcast. I know you're going to love it. So uh, before we get to that, I want to thank you guys first, uh, the listeners of this podcast and the loyalty that you guys show this podcast with all your posts on social media and all the response that I get uh, through email and and through my Instagram account, uh, the direct messages. Just really appreciate your loyal support. Uh, if you if you do have questions or comments or anything you want to talk to me about or uh, comments about the podcast, people you want to hear, see, etc., um, you can uh, email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail you can also send me a direct message on my Instagram account at J Scott Outdoors. And I just really appreciate you guys' support. And while we're talking about Instagram, uh, make sure Randy is actually on Instagram. Uh, it's Randy.Ulmer. That's U L M E R, Randy.Ulmer. And um, he's already got 4,700 followers. Uh, but you can go on there and see unbelievable trophies. I mean, the mule deer on his Instagram page are just absolutely amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I, I look at it as, as a privilege that Randy is on Instagram. He is putting photos of his trophies on Instagram. And just to go back and look at how many you know, the consistency of, of Randy's success is unbelievable. And we're going to talk about that on this podcast. Um, I want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. Uh, certainly the title sponsor, uh, go hunt insider, uh, go hunt insider. If you don't know is the best, uh, Western hunting resource out there. If you're researching States and want to know draw odds and statistics, there's no better resource than GoHunt.com insider and you can uh, sign up by going to gohunt.com forward slash j scott you can follow the prompts if you use the j scott promo code you're going to get a 50 dollar uh, go hunt gear shop gift card and i just really encourage you to check out the insider it's an amazing tool i want to thank them for their sponsorship also kuyu ultralight hunting as a bunch of you know, um, the Kuyu World Tour just got uh, done traveling over all over the western U.S., and it just was a huge success. And I want to thank Jason Harrison and his crew over there at Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Uh, Phonescope.com, if you use the JSCOT16 promo code, uh, you're going to get a 10% discount there at Phonescope, and that is the best digiscoping adapter where you can put... Sh- they can adapt any phone to any binocular, any any optic, any any spotting scope, uh, and you can be taking amazing video. All of the videos that you see on my Instagram are through the phone scope device, and I just want to thank uh, Cheston over there at Phone Scope for his sponsorship of this podcast. And last but not least, the Outdoorsman's, the Optics Authority here, right in my hometown in Arizona. Uh, and Cody Nelson, the Optics Authority, just an a, a amazing shop there at the Outdoorsman's with the, with the amount of business that they do. And they're very, very knowledgeable. They use all of the optics. And I just want to thank them for their sponsorship. If you use the J. Scott promo code, either online at Outdoorsman's.com or 1-800-291-8065, just tell them J. Scott promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount. Guys, let's get right to this episode, and again, thanks for listening. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm sitting here with friend Randy Ulmer. We're sitting in his backyard out on the patio, and it's December 13th, and we're both both in short-sleeve shirts. I'm in a shorts here, and Randy's got flip-flops on, and 
beautiful weather here in uh, Cave Creek, right? Cave Creek, Arizona. Beautiful Cave Creek, Arizona. Yeah, we live in a resort town. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't a resort town when I moved here, but it, it is now, and it, it's uh, it, this is why we live in Arizona. Well, of course, we both grew up here, but uh, and we both kind of migrated to Colorado for the summer. Yeah, and we're just there's not, a common. We're not as young as we used to be, and that 115 degree weather is a little brutal. Yeah, you know, um, I, we were just talking before we started here, and I remember coming to your 50th birthday party here at the house, and um, now you're, this is about 10 years, so you're about 60, right? Exactly. And I'm, I'll be 45 in February, but we've been friends a long time. I, I really don't even know. It's probably been close to 20 years where I've at least, oh, at least. known you. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, you know, you played sports with... Uh, with some of my nephews and uh, and some of their friends, uh, I know you golfed against some of some of them and some of their friends back in back that, in high school. That seemed like that seems like such a long time ago. People ask me, they're like, "Man, we used to know you as a golfer, and do you do you golf anymore?" And I say, "I don't golf at all. I I haven't golfed probably once in five years." Well, you know, golf is a time consuming. And also, uh, it takes up a lot of your mental capacity. I know my brother Rusty got into golf real heavy about ten or fifteen years ago, and and uh, he was so taken up by golf, and he worked and worked and worked, and and uh, you know he got decent, but he, you know there's a there it takes a lot of work yes, and a does. lot of time to be a good golfer, and uh, you know if you're going to be a uh, if you're going to be a hunter and an outdoors person and a fisherman and and all that, uh, you know, Gene's only going to let you take yeah. so much only time so for all your hobbies. personal <laughs> hobbies. You know, I think one of the things that's so crazy about golf is, it, for me, it's such a technical sport. Of if if you you can probably relate to this somewhat, maybe with your veterinary business and stuff, other things that you've been good at in life. If you don't stay on top of it, if you haven't been doing it and you go and do it, and you're not as sharp as you used to be, it's not as fun as it used to be. And for me, with golf, the reason I, I still follow the game, I still watch, I have a few friends that play professionally and what have you, but I still say that I love the game, but I don't play it. And it's one of those things that if I'm not going to be sharp at it, then I'm probably not going to have fun at it, and I'm, therefore I'm not going to do it. So that's kind of my story with golf. Um Randy, we're sitting here, beautiful weather. Um, you are known around the hunting industry as someone that has, for a long period of time, been an unbelievable shot as far as your ability to shoot a bow. My que- my first question starting out here is, when did you first realize that you were better than most where and I guess I kind of want to dig into you started just like anybody else and maybe you can tell us about that but then when did you kind of realize that your ability to be on target and shoot accurately was better than most well um you know Rusty and I my my brother uh both had little fiberglass recurves when we were kids we probably got them when we were seven or eight and we kept them and shot them and got got uh my grandfather had some long bows that that we inherited and shot and so we'd been shooting since we were kids but rusty really got into the bow hunting first and uh and uh he bought a compound bow and went out and and uh and just had a blast just had a blast said man this is so much different than rifle hunting it's so much more exciting you see so much more game so i bought a bow immediately thereafter and the next year we went out and uh and uh shot and we we had no mentors we knew no one that bow hunted uh, we actually just bought our our bows uh from a a, a local shop and and we bought a, a dozen 2219 arrows and just went out and shot ourselves i mean we spent that first summer uh we were working construction but it was a big construction site and we were working swing shifts so we had all morning to shoot and that's all we did is just went out in the sand hills and shot and shot and shot we shot so much that we wore the we wore the uh, anodization off those black 2219 Eastern Arrows. Um, and we shot together for probably two or three years and really hunted together and never uh, never shot with anybody else. And 
I started shooting a league, uh, like a bow hunting league. And the guys in there said, man, you, you're a pretty good shot. And I'm like, am I? And they said, yeah. So how old are you roughly? Oh, at, at that this? point I was probably, I can't remember, 21, 22, 23 years old. And, um, so I went to a, uh, a state championship shoot they said hey come to the state championships and just shoot and so I went to that and I won (laughs) so I guess to answer your question that would have been the time I thought oh well yeah wow we could shoot pretty good now that being said we had both competed uh in rifle shooting competition Rusty was a state championship small bore shooter in high school and uh and uh he was always a better rifle shooter than I but uh, we both competed and so, uh, you know, we had some degree of knowing how to shoot a weapon accurately. I mean, we had that basic, uh, basic background. Rusty, I saw him up on the strip, not this year, but last year. And he had told me that he was, he'd actually kind of reverted back and has really gotten back into long range shooting. Um, I don't know if he still is, but he was really into it and doing matches and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, he, uh, you know, I don't think he hunts much. Well, other than for Cooster, I don't think he really hunts much with a rifle. He's he's always been mostly a bow hunter, but he's always been fascinated with rifles. Uh, yeah, I actually went to a match of his two weeks ago, um, and I think they call it practical long range or something like that, But but these guys are phenomenal, and he is, like, at the top of the game. Um, you know, he goes to nationals and all that, but, but, uh, for those of you who don't know what they do is they, they go out there and they have, I think a two minutes to shoot eight shots, I believe. And every shot's at a different target at a different range. And they have to dial the turret, judge the wind, <laughs> figure out the rotation of the earth, whatever, all these long distances. And they are hitting, um, you know, and, and it's practical, meaning you have to lean against this post or you have to shoot it prone or you have to shoot it offhand. And they're shooting at these two inch targets at 200 yards or, you know, and, and, and it's amazing how, how seldom they miss. Mm-hmm. I would not want to invade this country with all those guys Sharpshooters. on top of a mountain. Yeah. Yes. It is crazy though. When You know, it's kind of like a lot of things, though, when you really dive into the technical aspects of shooting, whether it be archery or whether it be a rifle, like you talk about the, you know, gravitational pull of the earth and the, you know, the, the, all of the crazy stuff that would blow people's mind. Archery has an element of real technical aspect to it too, which you have really dove into one of the things that I think is so interesting knowing you is you are super meticulous about a lot of things. And then maybe there's other things that you're not as meticulous about. Like you may have something on your bow and it's like, what is that? Oh, it's just, and it's real practical. It's not like super technical, like what you would see on a target archer's bow, but it might be something on your bow that it just works for you in the field. Do you know what I mean? So my question, I guess, is you have a portion of your personality that is super meticulous, and then you have a portion of your personality that is, I don't want to use the word not organized, but you you have an element of, you know, like, um, I guess it is. There's portions of your life or, or things you do that are not as organized. How is being how do you balance both of those of being super meticulous about some of your archery stuff and then maybe not as meticulous about others, I guess? Well, it really comes down to just a lot of experience. Uh, I shot target archery for years and years and years. And in target archery, I mean, if you're competing at the, at the world-class level you're you're doing world tournaments national tournaments you cannot win if you make any mistakes and you have to know your equipment inside and out and you also have to know uh, how your equipment performs in different situations and how you perform in different situations so you can compensate and that's the only way you're going to win now you take that and that's that's what you'd call your high-tech part of the, the 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 scheme you take that and you you blend it uh, uh, and put it into a hunting environment. Uh, you blend your target archery skills with your hunting skills. And what you find is 
is you do not have to be nearly as precise in a hunting situation and and I am not one of those guys that takes long shots I just don't and there's reasons for that uh first of all I'm a veterinarian and you know I I really do I like to eat animals that's all we eat is really elk and deer and and antelope whatnot but I do not want to wound an animal I I I don't I have no issues with with shooting what I eat uh, but I don't want to wound an animal so my maximum range unless I've already hit an animal but my maximum range is 60 I I I close the gap to 60 and uh, let me back up just a little bit I spend probably depending on the year 40 to 50 days every summer scouting um for you know I love hunting mule deer and I scout for mule deer and and in that time I usually find one deer or two deer uh but usually just one deer that that's the deer I want to hunt and that's the deer I want to kill so for me to take a chance on wounding or missing that deer and scaring it uh you know oftentimes I've watched the deer for days and days and days and waiting for this one opportunity and any shot beyond 60 yards is 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 risky so I, d- I don't shoot very far however when i do shoot i want really good accuracy but back to my original point uh, you don't have to be as accurate uh, if you're shooting 3d archery competitively now at the world class level and you're you, you want to win at the world class level you really need to be shooting a three inch group at 60 yards two inch group at 60 yards with your hunting bow you're shooting at a deer at 60 yards you really have eight inches you know maybe even more on a big mule deer maybe 10 inches so you don't have to be as perfect so um and plus you don't want to be climbing around the hills with a with a lens in your sight you don't want to be climbing around the hills with a you know a 24 30 inch stabilizer uh, which you need to be perfectly accurate and also dragging your your hunting bow through the brush and across the rocks and throwing on the back of the quad or a horse or your backpack whatever it is not going to maintain the same tune perfect tune as your target bow would and there's environmental things as well so so that when you talk about maybe not being as precise on certain things when you're hunting you know, and when I'm hunting the high country, I don't even usually use a stabilizer. So you're you're giving up certain things to gain other things. You know, my hunting bow doesn't weigh much. My target bow weighs eight pounds. I'm not going to carry an eight-pound bow through the woods. So the precision is not as important. So so you're not as – you you let certain things go. Mm-hmm. Now, I hope I asked – I kind of yeah. went on a tangent there. I hope I no, answered your questions. You know, when you, when you were – really trying to learn and hone your skill of becoming the best shot that you could be. I've heard you before talk about where you've actually, you know, you, you set the bow up and the machine shot it for you. Right. And, and, and my question would be, you knew that there was an element that, that you had to execute the shot, but then you also knew that the equipment had to be absolutely precise in order for you to be precise well one of the things yeah one of the things that 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 most bow hunters don't know because they don't have enough confidence in their shot is there are certain bows that will shoot very well and there are certain bows that will have issues and it's not nearly as bad nowadays Uh, i shoot hoyt and and really i don't have many problems anymore but uh, years ago, um, you know, I would get, and I'm talking years ago, 20 years ago, I would get five bows from my sponsor, and one of those bows would shoot very, very well. And I always thought... All the same? Oh, all exactly the same, the same and bow. just one was a shooter. I had to get five back in those days just to get one that was a shooter, and, and to make it a shooter, I'd still have to modify it quite a bit and do this and that, you know, put different kind of axles in it. I would have to put different spacers, different strings, and... And I'd have to shim the limbs and on and on and on to get that bow to shoot good. And technology has come so far. And in the leading, leading my manufacturers, the technology is so good and the quality control is so good that it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. But the, the, the issue is that 
a a I always wondered how a hunter that got a a bow that was not very good quality they didn't know they blamed it on themselves so having the confidence to be able to 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 shoot and know that okay that is the bow but you talked about putting the bow on the shooting machine and really you know i think shooting machines i do have a shooting machine i a couple of them actually but a shooting machine really can't tune your bow because it doesn't hold the bow the same way you do so you can't tune your bow however you can look at the the rotation of the wheels and get wheel rotation perfectly from you know from the beginning which is really important from the beginning of the cycle through the very end of the cycle at full draw and there's a couple other things you can do with the machine you can you can you know balance your limbs so that they're they're moving so that there's not any kind of wheel rot or wheel lean so there's a lot of things you can do with a shooting machine but you cannot tune a bow you know to shoot a perfect bullet hole through paper or group a, a, a bow with the shooting machine you have to do it uh and and no one can tune your bow for you you have to tune it because everyone holds a bow a little differently however the great thing that a shooting machine will do is it will actually group your arrows so if you have a dozen arrows and you want to know where your arrows are hitting or if you've got a flyer a shooting machine can do that for you very quickly whereas you know since i started shooting competitively i've always numbered my arrows and i always keep a a uh, kind of a spreadsheet on every arrow like even last summer i had i think 70 arrows hunting arrows and and um i have a notebook and every time i shoot every one of those arrows i mark where it hits and you'll get a pattern and you've got out of those 70 arrows you know uh you know most of them are going to group very well and there's going to be a few of them that just always hit the middle if you're in the middle and uh so that that's the best thing a shooting machine can do for you that's interesting and you know it sounds like um Arrows are a lot like elk calls, like you got to go through a bunch of them before you find a, a couple good ones. How much better, you've been doing this a long time, how much better has the technology gotten where the arrows are shooting better, straighter, more consistent? Well, really, uh, you know, I started shooting Eastern aluminum arrows, and there is nothing more accurate than an, than an aluminum arrow. Um, you know, if they have really good tolerances, which, you know, the, the upper end of the Eastern arrows have always had really good straightness tolerances, but, uh, the problem with aluminum arrows is they can bend, you know, you fall over on your quiver, you can get a dink in your arrow, you know, a little dent in your arrow, or you can bend an arrow. And, you know, if you shoot them long enough at high enough speed, you're going to, you're going to end up bending some of them. So, uh, when you talk about technology, the, the aluminum arrows were very, very accurate, but they weren't durable. And also they, with the big diameter, they, they had a lot of issues, you know, a decay of downrange velocity and, and, uh, you know, wind drift and that sort of thing. And they didn't penetrate as well. So I went from, from aluminum arrows to, uh, the AC arrows, aluminum carbon arrows when Easton came out with those, whatever, 30 years ago. And those were straight and they didn't bend much. Nowadays, I actually shoot, um, shoot mostly uh pure carbon arrows i shoot the eastern injection uh and the reason being is even the uh aluminum carbon can bend if you fall on your quiver you know you'd have to fall pretty hard to to get a little bend in those arrows but i like the all carbon arrows because i do group them and and the carbon technology has come so far uh so arrow technology is, has come a long ways in all the carbon technology and the aluminum carbon technology now you can shoot a pure carbon arrow and you pretty much can't bend one you can break them and and they're so small diameter now it's even hard to break them so and you know if, if you group them then they're going to group just as well as aluminum arrows uh, you know it takes a little more work to get them to group perfectly but you know they got great penetration they got great downrange velocity and and uh and you know i still shoot a, a relatively hero, a heavy arrow compared to to most people but uh um uh, the uh the carbon arrows just kind of nowadays just just meet all my requirements and all my desires as a hunter educate me on why does an aluminum arrow why is it more accurate well aluminum is very well 
it didn't start out this way, but Easton uh, perfected making a perfectly consistent aluminum tube. And in the beginning, and not so much now, but but even still, uh, in order for a dozen arrows to hit in the same exact spot, they have to be consistent in diameter. They have to be consistent. They have to be perfectly straight. And they have to have consistent spine down the length of the arrow and around the shaft. And aluminum lends itself to being perfect in all aspects that way. The composite of aluminum The, 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 the way itself. they extrude, and I don't know if extrude, I don't think extrude's the right name for it, but I, well, whatever the name of for, for the engineering process they go through to take a, a big aluminum pipe and make it into a very thin-walled, uh, small-diameter aluminum pipe, uh, the technology and the consistency of aluminum, especially the grades of aluminum, that they started with whatever 30 years ago the xx75 and and the other aluminum grades that they have now uh the aluminum uh, tends to be very very consistent in all those aspects and weight is the other thing i forgot whereas carbon with the technology they have for carbon carbon tends not to be nearly as consistent everything's good okay carbon tends to be uh less consistent and especially when carbon first came out 25, 30 years ago, uh, carbon tends to be much less consistent in its spine from arrow to arrow, its spine around the shaft, its weight. Now, they've gotten a lot better. Uh, and as long as you group your arrows, it doesn't matter. Uh, but they have gotten a lot better. But aluminum just lends itself to making the perfect projectile other than the fact that it bends and it's and, and it's and it's it's large in diameter and it's uh it it's aluminum tends to be heavy uh and when i say heavy i don't mean heavy but in order to get a light aluminum shaft you have a, like i have a 12 thousandths wall which is pretty darn uh small and they tend to dent um but i like to shoot a heavy arrow when i say heavy arrow uh uh, you know, I actually hunt with a 500 grain arrow, and in order to get a carbon arrow to shoot 500 grains, I have to add weight to the front of the arrow. I have to use a very stiff spine. I shoot 125 grain broadhead. Um, so aluminum just lends itself to be the perfect arrow. And if we weren't worried about penetration and there was no such thing as wind, arrow uh, aluminum arrow would be perfect. Okay. I want to talk you at mentioned about mule deer and you mentioned your love for mule deer and scouting if i ask you your favorite animal to hunt would it be mule deer well i ha- i'm going gold's turkey hunting with you next spring so <laughs> i i have to wait till can't i can't rule that, that out yet. i can't <laughs> rule that out yet from what you're telling me i uh i'm a very unsuccessful turkey hunter i think actually the last time i was successful hunting turkeys was with my youngest son levi and jay was actually doing the calling and and guiding and everything i was just sitting there jay says don't move and i said okay <laughs> but i'm a very unsuccessful turkey hunter but uh I hope to be a success. Tur- Jay says these turkeys are really dumb, and that's what I what I need to kill a turkey with my bow. <laughs> I'll so, take every dumb turkey. So I anyway, get. to answer your question, uh, not not ruling Gold's turkeys out. Um, I, oh dear! Now, if you had asked me that question twenty five years ago, I would have said elk, and and that's only because I couldn't kill a big mule deer. Uh, I I had a love hate relationship with mule deer. I, I I I loved to hunt them, but I hated them because any deer over three years old was impossible for me to kill at that time. And and I I kind of learned my learning curve for elk uh, uh, was not as steep as it was for deer. I it, it, I finally figured out how to kill big elk, and uh, that was about ten years or fifteen years before I learned how to kill big mule deer because big mule deer. Are, very, 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 very hard to kill, and, and but that's what makes them fun. Plus, the country they live in. I really love high country mule deer, and I love desert mule deer, and I love mid level mule deer. So They're mule deer smart. is kind of the king. Mule deer until you just, until you hunt Gould's like turkey. You, we'll report back after that. We'll do a podcast and we'll ask Randy how his Gould's hunt was compared to his high country mule deer. You talk about desert deer. 
you've hunted mule deer on the strip. You've hunted mule deer kind of in every terrain, but you talk about loving the high country mule deer. What is it about the high country that you like so much? Well, um, there is something, and this is going to sound a little out there, but there is something about being in the high country uh, that um, spiritually does something very special to me and I can't tell you what it is it's just being up there and and I love hunting mule deer and I think up there and I think the reason I love hunting mule deer up there is because I get to scout them for so long Uh, I scout them you know pretty much all July and August and you know there is no place in the world that I know of that's more beautiful than the high country in July and August. And if you were going to take away my scouting or you were going to take away my hunting uh, for high country deer, uh, I, hands down, I'd let you take away my hunting because the hunting usually doesn't last very long at all. Um, And it's usually very pressure packed because it's all public land and you're competing with people and that's never any fun. And even if you're not competing with people, you're worried that you are going to compete with people as soon as they find your deer and you've got a month and a half invested in that deer. But just, I spent, well, this year I probably spent 40 days sleeping up in the high country, uh, hunting, sleeping, scouting, and uh, it's just heavenly. I mean, it's like I've I've ranged my life to where I can finally do that at this age and and let my, you know, my 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 money making my work uh, kind of slide for that month and a half and uh that's been my goal my whole life and it's just i mean i look forward to it right now it's it's uh almost christmas right now and i just can't wait for july mm-hmm. i just love it yeah you talk about a steep learning curve with mule deer and any deer over 3 years old for a long time it took you a long time to figure out how to kill them what was it that finally pushed you over the top where you felt like you had confidence? And was it was it an actual, the ability to kill them or was it the ability to find them? No, I've always been able to find them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I started hunting mule deer. I think I had my first mule deer tag when I was nine years old in Arizona. You could do it back then. And, and uh I hunted them, hunted them, was fascinated with the hunted them, and just couldn't figure out how to get it done. And I'd sneak up on them, and they'd run away. And to be honest with you, you know, I started, I think I started killing big mule deer when I was 40. And the thing is, is, is I had whatever, 30 years of experience. And in that 30 years, I think I had done everything that you could possibly do wrong and something kicked in when I was 40 I think a big part of it was I just became more patient but something finally kicked in and and it was like you know you're doing all these stupid things you got to quit doing all those stupid things and anything that would make a deer run away you got to quit doing that but I think a big part of it was just being older and being more patient uh it used to be I'd see a big buck and I think okay I got to get him right now got to get him right now because if I don't get him right now I'm never going to see him again and I would go and rush in there and try to kill him and it just would never work out and nowadays I mean I mean geez the deer I killed this year one of the deer I killed this year I spent four days with him of course I couldn't find him for three of those days (laughs) but and you know back 25 years ago if I hadn't seen that deer on the first day I would have said well you know he's gone but I, I went and I just backpacked in, and, and uh, so I was way, 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 way up there, 13,000 feet, and I just stayed there and waited and waited. And, and each day, yeah, I don't care how much you've hunted deer, each day you're just a little m- bit more sure that deer's never going to show up. On the fourth day, there he was. And that brings up my next question. So the older you've gotten, the more patient you've gotten is what I'm hearing. And then the persistence factor, which I've always known you to be very persistent and you haven't been able to kill what you've killed without being persistent. Um, 
being able to mentally, okay, everybody has their own time schedule. Everybody has their own responsibilities, whether it be financial or family or, you know, work or whatever it may be. One thing that I, I think that you have mastered in watching you hunt, I've hunted with you and stuff and watched you is you seem to have the ability mentally to block a lot of things out and stay focused on the task. How has that morphed over the years of having all the different, you're, you know, you have, you're a family man, you're a husband, you, you know, you've got lots of business endeavors, you've got things, but, but I think you've also been able to realize what you're doing is important and how, how has that morphed over the years and how have you been able to stay focused and how do you still to this day, is it easier now? You know, that type of thing, how, um, the mental side of it. Well, um, one of the things I learned very early on, uh, you know, when I started hunting very seriously, I was, had a very, very busy practice and I was always also, uh, you know, at some point shooting competitive archery and had a lot of other things going on. And, and one of my goals because I, you know, hunting's just like you, Jay. Hunting has been a passion of mine forever. And one of my goals was to put myself in the position to where I was on a, say, a 10-day backpacking hunt. I didn't have to worry about all these things. And I think one of the most important things that I that I did or is I made sure that I had, when I got married, I... You know, I, I talked a long time to my client, fiance, who's now my wife, and said, you know, I really want to be able to do this. It's extremely important to me. I know you don't understand, but I want to be able to go do this thing. So before we were even married, I explained that, hey, this is something that's very important to me. And then even my veterinary clients, I, I taught them, I taught them, I, you know, I would say, hey, you know, listen, I'm going to be gone in September and you know I'll have people to, here to, to do what needs to be done so and then in my other businesses I I've, over the years have found ways to prepare everything even my writing you know uh, I've just put myself in a position gradually and it's taken a long time to where when I go hunting there's no fires burning and if there's fires burning um uh, other people are either going to put them out or the people that are dealing with that realize that, Hey, this is just the way it is. Right. And you've, I've watched you for the last 25 years and you've done probably a better job with it than anyone. And then as far as it, when it comes to kids, you know, I've, I've, I've been in the situation. We had kids later in life. I mean, I didn't have my first son until I was 38 years old. So, um, you know, at that point, my, I had become successful enough in the businesses where I could spend a lot of time with them. So I spent more time with my kids than, than anybody I know. And, 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 you know, I, I coach all their, not all their sports, but I coach their high school mountain bike team, coached other things. I've been a scout leader since they were in first grade. You know, we were, Tammy and I both been scout leaders for 14 years. And so we spent a great deal of time with our kids and we hunt with our kids but when i do go on a hunting trip for say two weeks or you know three weeks on some extended elk hunt or whatever a sheep hunt you know my kids know that they're not losing out because i'm gone right and uh, as we've been married longer and longer my wife encourages me to go on longer <laughs> and longer hunts <laughs> yeah it's amazing how that works isn't it? it's amazing how that works <laughs> so so to answer your question i think you know, when you have all your fires put out, when you don't, when your wife's, wife's not mad at you when you're gone, when you're, you know, when you're, you're missing your kid's little league game, but you've been coaching their little league forever, you know, all of a sudden all that guilt and all that worry is, uh, it's not gone, but it's minimized. And the one thing I have learned, you talked about persistence. And if you, if you have something nagging you out in the field, like, you know, you've got a business deal that you're going to lose or your boss is going to be mad because you're gone. Those things just wear on you. And, you know, hunting, especially hunting in, in difficult situations or for one animal, 
it can be very mentally draining, you know, because of all the, especially bow hunting, all the things that can go wrong. You just, you have to have an an upbeat attitude. And it's so much more easy, so much easier to have an upbeat attitude if if everything's going good at home. Mm-hmm. That's good advice. Um, not only have you been successful in archery and in hunting and in business and life and, and such, a lot of times on this podcast, I like to bring in, you know, life lessons and what have you. And you bring up a good point about, you know, kind of, I want you to kind of reiterate or talk a little bit more about it. But for those young guys that are starting out that are, you know, maybe in high school, maybe in college, maybe they've just graduated from college. Maybe they're kind of just starting their career. Maybe they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Maybe they don't know what they're going to do. Um, I get a lot of people ask me and they say, man, you get to hunt a lot. You get to do this. I want you to talk a little bit about choosing something that you can do that will allow you to have time. In other words, how did you, did you by design set up your profession or the ability to make money, which would then in turn allow you to spend time doing the things you love? And what advice could you give someone that's just starting, you know, like a life kind of lesson of, you know, this is what, if you could give them some wisdom, what would it be? Well, this is probably not going to be what you expect to hear. Uh, but I'll tell you exactly what I've told my two sons. And that is, um, uh, let me take a step back. What I see is most of my friends that are making a living in the hunting industry started off maybe not having a profession and they they're they're on a shoestring budget they're able to go on these hunts because you know someone else is paying for them they're trying to get sponsors to pay for them or whatever they're doing or they're shooting competitively and they're just barely making it just barely making it and a lot of times they're busiest especially if they're involved in the outdoor outdoor industry or the archery industry or the outdoor industry the gun industry whatever they're so busy during the important times of the year uh like my friend i have a lot of friends that are in the uh archery manufacturing business and they're so busy this time of year when you should be out hunting uh, in the early fall because they got to get their catalog out they got to get the new products out they you know they they and then in the winter they have to do all the shows or people that i have friends and relatives that own archery um shops and their busy time is during the hunting season so yes they're in the outdoor industry they're they're working in the outdoor industry but it's exactly that it's work i tell my boys there is nothing as valuable as time time is the most important thing to me because it allows you to spend time doing what you want to do with your family and i know this is going to sound crass but money buys you time. It really does. And if you want your hunting or your archery shooting, whatever it is, if you want that to be your hobby, your pleasure, the thing that you look forward to, be very careful about making it your work. Because a lot of people I know in the outdoor industry have made it their work and they don't enjoy it much anymore. It makes them a living. But to be honest, most people in the outdoor industry do not make very much money. I mean, they make a good living. I shouldn't say that. They don't make the kind of money that will allow them to have the time and the freedoms that that they really want. So <laughs> education is everything, in my opinion. Uh, I would I encourage my boys, I say, go and get a degree in something that you can own your own business because owning your own business in in America is everything. There's so many tax advantages. There's so many freedoms. You're your own boss. You can take time off whenever you want. Uh, nobody can fire you. So be your own boss. Figure out how you can make some money and also figure out a profession where you can take time off, where you're not the only player. Someone else can fill in for you. And if you can make passive income, by investments, you know, by doing something like Jay, you, and I, your listeners may not know this, but Jay's 
been very successful at real estate investing and and uh and something like that where it gives you some some money where you can make money when when you're when you're there you can take time off um if you can do that if you can if you can become comfortable enough financially it's going to take the pressure off your wife it's going to take the pressure off your kids and then you can go do what you want and you're not out there during hunting season trying to trying to scratch out a living you're out there hunting because you want to i've had i've had multiple opportunities to become involved in the archery manufacturing business uh i've had uh multiple opportunities to host a television show and i i don't say i think about it i just say no i do not want and 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 i'm in a situation i'm very very fortunate to not have to do that to you know to to make a living for my family and and if i were in that situation i would have taken a a, i would have been I would have taken all those opportunities. I want my hunting, my shooting to remain fun. And it has because I've never had any pressure. I don't have to perform. I don't have to wait for the camera to get on that deer before I shoot him. I don't even know how those guys do it. I mean, I'm not skilled enough to to shoot a deer and have a cameraman behind me. Um, It comes down to a lot of timing that's not usually favorable (laughs) to the hunter. No, and then you, you know, I like to shoot big deer, and I, you know, I would have to shoot a littler deer because they're easier to get sneaked (laughs) up on. I mean, I have enough issues on my own without help from somebody else. You talk about your love for big deer, and is it is it just that simple? I mean, you know, someone looking from afar can say, "Oh, Randy Omer, you know, he shot everything under the sun, and he shoots. He's probably shot bigger mule deer than anybody alive, and you know, he's got sponsors and he's got people that he has to make happy." But is it truly? You just love to hunt big mule deer. I don't have to make anybody happy. I've told every sponsor I've ever had, I'm, you know, I, 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 first of all, with my sponsors, uh, you know, I've never approached anybody to be my sponsor. They've approached me and, and, and I've never, I've never accepted a sponsorship really, unless I'm like, that's the product I want to use anyway. Um, so I don't have to make anybody happy. I mean, they know that I do what I do. This is what I do. I'm not doing anything extra f- for you guys. And I, I never push anything. I mean, if it's appropriate when I'm on a podcast or if it's appropriate when I'm writing an article and, or in, in a, t- you know, doing some tip, I, I, you know, I'll mention a sponsor, but people know because I, I've been at this so long that if, if I'm promoting a product, that product is really, really you good because I'm not going to promote a product just because someone's going to give me a few thousand bucks. I'm yeah. just not going to do it. Um, so I don't even remember what the question was, Jay. <laughs> but but uh, I, I, I got a follow up in. It's kind of off the wall, but you maybe haven't heard this, but you've probably heard it said about other people. If I had his money, my trophy room would look like his. My question for you would. If you heard that, or if you heard that said about you, or if you heard it said about one of your friends, what would your answer be? Well, if <laughs> if you knew my uh, humble origins, I grew up in a trailer house. Of <laughs> you know, I, my brother and I used to sleep. Uh, you know, we didn't have enough bedrooms. We had five kids, and my brother and I slept <laughs> foot to foot on the couch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, you know, I don't belittle, I don't begrudge anybody having money. And, you know, if you're willing to work, you know, there is no country like America. If you're willing to work hard and you've got half a brain, you, you can become fairly successful Successful if you don't do a lot of stupid things uh, and if you, you work hard. But to, to answer your question, if I had his money, uh, you know, you, we've talked about, you and I have talked about hunting Africa or hunting these exotic places all around the world. And, and to be honest with you, you know, I have hunted Alaska, but I haven't gone to Africa. I just have no desire. I've really got no desire to go to New Zealand or hunt and, or all these different places where you can go and hunt. I love to hunt mule deer and I love to hunt elk. Unfortunately, I grew up in Arizona. I grew up in the West where I can do that and it costs very, very little money. I have to buy an out of state tag and yeah, you know, I, I've gone to Africa, I mean, not Africa, but I've gone to Alaska, I've hunted 
doll sheep and and uh you know i've fortunately i've drawn two two desert sheep tags in that in arizona and and, and uh nevada and i've drawn two big horn sheep in tags one in colorado one in montana or excuse me wyoming but so i have spent some money but you know to to think or for someone to think that uh you know i've gone on a a, a canned hunt uh it, you know and spent all this money and that's why i've been successful i would just <laughs> challenge you <laughs> to come hunt to come hunt mule deer with me and uh you know there's guys you know there's guys out there that could outwalk me up the mountain now but maybe 20 years ago i don't know not too many of them yeah. but but i still go up the mountain i just, i climb so many thirteen thousand foot mountains in the summertime that that i'm pretty darn skinny at the end of the summer but to, to take your 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 question one step further uh i do have a friend that and i don't think he'll mind well he's a mutual friend of ours casey brooks casey has you know casey's got a lot of money i mean a lot of money by a year and my standards and casey goes on some some uh, a few high dollar hunts i've been hunting with casey many times casey is the best elk hunter in the world i mean I used to think I was pretty good until I hunted with Casey. I mean, holy smokes. This guy is an elk hunting phenomenon. He works harder. He calls better. He shoots good. He does everything that you need to be to be a successful elk hunter. Does Casey have a whole lot of giant elk on his wall? Yes. He makes my elk collection <laughs> look like nothing. And and most of those are public land bulls. And he's, you know, paid a few... Uh, He's paid to go on a few Indian reservations, but you know what? That does not change the fact that he's the best elk hunter in the world. Mm-hmm. And you know, people always, and it's not. It's a very small percentage of people. Yeah, people are always jealous. You're going to be jealous of someone that has this or has that skill. And you know, Casey's just got mad skills. Does he have a little coin to to help him out? To because he loves to hunt elk to to go on a on a place where he can chase really big elk. He does mm-hmm. that doesn't change the fact that you He's take him yeah. on a public elk land with any other elk hunter in the world yeah. any other elk hunter yeah. you're a great elk hunter i consider myself a good elk hunter you take casey and he is going to mop up the floor with yeah. us don't you think i mean like you said in everything there's always going to be people that are jealous and what have you and it's just the way it is no matter what industry what profession whatever you're doing it's always easy to point at someone and say, well, if I had that, I could have this. And, you know, it's kind of a small minded thing. I think, um, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on it. Um, and it's always interesting because, you know, here you are on public land, you know, maybe, I don't even know, maybe you've shot one or two or three on private land somewhere over your history of shooting, you know, probably close to a hundred, I would bet maybe more mule deer. But I would bet 99% of them have been on public land. And it's tags that, you know, you still draw tags, you still hunt, just like everybody else does. Um, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic that you've shot what you have and you still have the desire to keep going and keep doing it. And it would almost be sad to me if I found out, oh, now Randy's, you know, not doing it anymore. He's doing something else. Um just because it's been so fun to watch the success that you've had. Speaking about success for mule deer, um, if you could give a couple tips as far as that learning curve you talked about and, you know, a couple things, maybe simple, maybe in-depth, whatever you want, that people could use to be more successful and be able to harvest bigger mule deer, what would they be? Well, as you were as you were asking that question, I, I thought of four things right off the bat. First of all, I think one of the reasons that that I've had this success that I've had is is because because I can shoot better than the average hunter. Um, and if if I know a lot of people that have gotten really close to mule deer and they kind of have a meltdown. Not that I don't. I mean, not that I still don't. But they have a big old buck stands up in front of them and and they have a a mental meltdown. Uh, And my ability to shoot under pressure, which I developed in the target archery arena, I would encourage people to learn how to shoot. 
then learn how to shoot under pressure. That would be number one. Number two would be patience. Realize that, you know, that buck isn't going to disappear into thin air. Once you've found him, be patient, wait for the right opportunity. And uh, when I say the right opportunity, again, I'm, I'm hunting one deer, typically, just one deer. And I don't, I will not stock that deer unless I think there's a extremely high percentage that I'm going to kill that deer. Because, you know, these deer are at least six years old more likely seven or eight and they've seen it all they do not tolerate anything you know uh, people say mule deer easy well yeah a four corn or a two two two-year-old deer even sometimes a three-year-old deer yeah you know they may not be as bright as as your average eastern whitetail but you get these older age class deer and they've had cougars chasing them every day of their life and they just don't tolerate anything so be patient wait for the right opportunity before you go in it and and next is is um, persistence you know uh, if you want to kill a big deer you can't shoot a lesser deer and you just have to stick with it and and that's hard for someone that's coming from the midwest or the east you know you say you only have a seven day hunt it's hard to be really persistent like I, I I would really always encourage you to have a lot of time so that you can take the time you need to do what has to be done. And um, lastly, I forgot what my fourth thing was, but I think it's uh, probably to be in, in, if you're going to hunt mule deer, what I see is a lot of guys, you know, they sit at home and you know, they they look at all, they listen to these podcasts and they they watch these videos and they think, oh, that high country is so beautiful. I'm I'm going to go up there and I'm going to I, I I'm going to I can do it. And and what happens is they're not mentally prepared um, or physically prepared for what it's really like. They'll get up there and you know they get a little altitude sickness and they climb three thousand vertical feet carrying a sixty pound backpack. They're pretty much finished, and you get the first little rain squall or, or snowfall or uh, you know they get a little hungry or they stub their toe and and they just want to go home to mama it's not it's easy to f- fantasize about it it's easy to dream about it it's not hard it's not easy to do it execute it yeah so so you really uh you need to get physically and mentally prepared you really do a technical question to ask you about big bucks, as much time as you've spent in specifically in the Colorado high country, which is where you have shot a lot of good bucks in a lot of states, but Colorado, is you, you have a second home there. Um, have you found a certain specific spot, terrain, elevation, something? Obviously, I'm trying to pick away here. Is there one thing that you could say that's a common denominator to finding the biggest bucks around? And not I'm not talking spot specific, but no, like terrain or something that, that you found without giving your number one secret. But You know, I used to say this about elk. I really didn't say it about mule deer, but I say it about mule deer now because since my my amount of time to scout has 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 increased and i have so much time to scout i i scout all and i always try to scout one new area every year one new unit one new mountain range and what i found well let's go back okay the deer i shot this year the in colorado the big deer i shot this year in colorado was at over thirteen thousand feet which is really high really, <laughs> really high um the deer I shot last year in that Colorado, that great big heavy drop tine buck, he was as low as you can get in Colorado in the unit and all the units that I mm-hmm. look at. Um, and that deer was close to the highway. I mean, blew me away. So what I found is that, no, there is not one particular place. I look everywhere. I look low. I look mid-range, mid, I don't really like mid-range in the Aspens and stuff in Colorado, and we're talking Colorado where, you know, it goes from whatever, 6,000 feet up to 13,000 feet. Uh, they're sagebrush bucks, 
and I really like cutting sagebrush bucks. Uh, first of all, I <laughs> I, can, I have more oxygen to deal with. <laughs> Your brain <laughs> and, isn't fried yeah, from exactly. altitude. And the, the other thing is about sagebrush bucks is you can usually get back out and you know sleep in your travel trailer or whatever. You're not up there in the wind and the cold. Uh, uh, but high country bucks, I like high country bucks, but high country bucks can just disappear. You know, they all they have to take, do is go a couple hundred yards, get in those thick, uh, thick evergreens, and they're gone. Or and and uh, the low country bucks usually they're uh, you can refine them. So I have absolutely not answered your question, and I'm not trying to be ambiguous or I'm not trying to to avoid your question, but really. I look everywhere, well, in a, in a particular area, let's say in a particular basin that has mountains and, and lowlands, you know, I, I, uh, I talk to people, I, I, you know, where, you know, we talk to the biologists, whatever, find out where the deer are if you're hunting, for the time of year you're hunting, find out where the deer are, look in those places, and I'm looking for the biggest deer I can find that summer. So if I find the biggest deer down in the sagebrush, I'm hunting in the sagebrush and that's what I did last year. And then this year I found the biggest buck I could find was as high as you can get. And it's quite a dichotomy. I mean, to hunt those two different deer in those two environments and you've got to hunt them differently. But, uh, I like to look everywhere. I just like to, I like to putz around in the woods. I, that's what I really like to do. I just like to hike around in the woods, mountain bike in the woods and, and uh, always packing my my uh, spotting scope with me. Speaking of spotting scope, and speaking of you know long range glassing and such, um, I know when the doctors came out, you know you probably had the first pair of doctors. I know you helped me get my first pair of doctors. Um, then the coas came out, and you were using coas, and um, you know, it's interesting, the Swarovski's come out with that BTX, and, you know, Swarovski's come out with that 95-millimeter spotting scope, which I use and is unbelievable. Um, are you still using long-range glass, you know, big 30-plus power binoculars? Are you using 15s, or, you know, kind of what is your go-to lately? Well, you know, I've got a couple pair of doctors. I've got a couple pair of coats. I'm a, I'm an optics freak, as you well know. And I I if anything new comes out, I that's what I get Tammy to get me for Christmas or for my birthday, and uh, she thinks I've got a. I'm going to slide over just a sec. The sun. Okay. She thinks I have issues, and I I think I do too. But it's okay. Um, I thought I died and went to heaven when that Swarovski 95, uh, that is the dream. And, of mm -hmm. course, I got the BTX. I got the doubler. And the BTX is 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 good. It's It's got some issues. Uh, but, yes, to answer your question, if I'm driving or I'm on my quad uh, or my side-by-side, -side, whatever, I will. And if I, Or if I'm not hiking very far, I love to use the Koas. Love to use the Koas. I love them. And... Uh, I remember, I think the only time I've seen you almost cry is when you were going down to Mexico and and the border agent pulled your coas out and dropped them on the concrete. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. It yeah. wasn't funny. Yeah. It At wasn't the time funny. It wasn't, yeah. But anyway, uh, that was long ago, but. Um, it's funny. I remember you in Arizona. We had we were punting down there in those four, 40s, I guess, 40 super wide angles fell off the back of your quad. They didn't fall off. I was hunting with <laughs> Jay and I were hunting down for coos deer, and and I, I wasn't hunting. My ten year old son was hunting, and uh, he would. I had strapped the uh, koas to the back of the um, my pack with that the koas in them to the back of the quad, and my ten year old son wasn't quite comfortable, so he kept pushing back and pushing back until the pack fell off, <laughs> and we drug it. <laughs> for a quarter of a mile <laughs> and the, my binoculars, the whole tube off of oh head. my binoculars were laying in pieces uh and and you know that they're very expensive and i and of course my son didn't know and you know he wasn't thinking and and uh but yeah yeah so actually yeah we both almost cried <laughs> over those but no i really loved that swarovski uh uh spotting scope and and i'm one of those people that have no issue at all looking through one eye and glassing with one eye a lot of people it really kind of freaks them out uh or just causes some issues um so 
to be honest with you, most of the time, if I'm backpacking, I don't take the BTX. All I do is take my, uh, my, my, uh, my large, uh, 95 millimeter, uh, objective, uh, Swarovski spotting scope. That thing is just a dream. And, and then I, are you glassing with tens or fifteens or? Oh, I go, take fifteens. Yeah. Swarovski fifteens. You know, when the Swarovski BTX came out, I got the BTX and used it, but I, the more I glassed with it this summer and the more I used it this fall, and one of the things I liked really about the doctors was it was a straight, and when they went to the Koas, I got the Koas, and I never really did embrace the angled, just don't really like it, and then I got the twin Swarovski spotters with the 25 by 50 wide angle, and they were phenomenal. I was using them last coos deer season, and then in the in the off season, they came out with the BTX, got the BTX, and I've used it a bunch in the summer, used it this fall, and I'm actually coos deer leaving on Sunday. I'm going back to the twin spotters, and the main reason for me is the straight and the yeah. angled. I'm yeah. just, I can't, I know a lot of guys love angled. I know a lot of guys love angled spotting scopes. I've just been a straight spotting scope guy i've been a straight binocular and so i'm going back to the twin spotters i was just curious you know if the angled had given you any problem or the ability to look at 32 power or 50 power depending on what eyepiece with the koas did that overweigh the fact that you just adapted to how to glass at an angle you know one thing about coos deer hunting is a lot of times you're looking down get up on top of ridge look down it's really hard with an angled uh spotting with an angled uh, uh binocular system uh and the other thing, if if you're uh, using that system, you almost have to carry a chair with you to sit and look down uh, to look to look that you have to carry a chair with you a stool, which is not an issue. One of the things I do like about the Koas is uh, when you're looking through a straight spotting scope or a straight set of binoculars, you actually um, have to keep the the binocular higher up. And in the west here, we all, especially if you're hunting in the high altitude, there's always wind. And what I've found is the higher up your binoculars are on the tripod, the more vibration you get. And and you get a real high wind and you get those coas, you get them right next to the ground and, and they just don't shake very much at all. So that's a benefit. So there there are trade-offs. But then when you try to start glassing down with the coas, it's like, you know, how high do I have to get to look straight down with these things? You almost can't do it. Um but I really like the coas because you know they're panachromatic, meaning that that the 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 you see around the edges almost as well as you see in the center, and that's was my big complaint about the doctors is I really love to feel the view of the doctors, but you know you really had to move the binoculars a lot more because uh you really had to be looking through the center of that objective lens or center of the the ocular whatever you had to look yeah. through the center to be able to to see really well and and also. Uh, and I don't know, this just may be my imagination, but they they seem to be gray. Everything seems to be shades of gray. And when you look through the coas, it's like, Bright. boom. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, look at all those colors. And when you're hunting coos deer, you know, uh, you know, seeing the different shade of an ear, or just the different, yeah, you know, just the little different shades can, can help you pick up an antler or something like that. And, and, uh, so I didn't like that. And then you get, you take this, the Swarovski binoculars or the Swarovski spotting scope, and it takes it even to a higher level yet. What my dream would be is to have two, uh, of the, the 95s, uh, put together like you have with those twin spotters. And I don't even know that you, I don't know if you could get them close enough together because, um, you know, their objective lens is so big, you might not be able to squeeze them tight enough to even get your eyeballs. Well, I know my eyes are so close together, it wouldn't work for me, but I actually know someone that that has it. But I think your eyes have to be wider, way wider than mine. Because when I look through just a regular set of 15s, I have to actually stagger the eye cup on it to squeeze them together. And Dar's even so, his squinty-eyed, we'll call him, uh, tight, that he actually has to take his eye cups off to really? squeeze them together. You guys are beady eyed. Yeah, beady eyed little I didn't suckers. Realize yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Little uh, uh, rifle vultures, like you used to call us. I got to tell a story <laughs> on Randy. He's probably not going to like me telling the story, but 
he found a big giant deer down in Mexico and he was stalking this thing and then he'd sit and watch it just like he told you in the podcast how he, he always wanted the buck to be in exactly the right position and and um a couple days had gone by and Randy was just waiting for this deer to get in the right position and I think at dinner or something um we said, well, Randy, how's it going with that deer? And, you know, you, you're like, well, pretty good. But with you rifle vultures hovering up there watching, like, you you know, we were just waiting for Randy to um, uh, make a mistake or something. Like we were sitting there. He, he made it sound like we were sitting there with our rifles ready to shoot it as soon as Randy made a mistake. And I thought, always thought that was funny because we had some good banter back and forth about, like, you better get this done because um, – uh, you know, we can shoot them from that knob up there. And you were like, yeah, you better not. Well, the funny thing about that is, is you and Dar and Zach, my nephew and I all thought that buck had the potential to be the world record. Uh, well, he's definitely going to be the world record with a bow. And he actually had the potential to be like the world record, with the rifle, which is giant. And I, and, 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 um, you know, most of the time when I went down to Mexico, I was hunting where Jay, you know, had scouted and found all the deer and, and this happened to be a one place where I had actually gone down and, and found the place and everything. And and so the deal was that I invited Jay and Dar down, but I, I, I got to chase this one deer with my bow because I was hunting with a bow and they were hunting with rifles. And anyway, uh, <laughs> Jay's not telling you the whole story. They're actually <laughs> helping me because this deer's so big that they want to see it die. Yeah, I just and wanted I to am, watch it. I, I Even if it didn't die, I just wanted to watch the thing. And I am doing everything I can to spook this deer out of the country and I just it zigs I zag and they're sitting up on this hill thinking oh my gosh <laughs> this guy is pathetic <laughs> and and there were several times I don't know how many times but multiple times that they're sitting on this knob and the deer shows up under their knob or he walks over under their knob and they've got their rifles up there in case we see a different deer and this deer's by far bigger than any deer any of us have ever killed <laughs> and so they're sitting there with their guns shells in the chamber and they got the deer is within rifle range and they had the restraint not to shoot it and uh and uh anyway it's it's a long story but yeah i chased that deer for geez 10 days. well and and the worst situation was i was uh i wanted to shoot it you know being pope and young legal so we weren't using any communication devices. We were giving hand signals. We were doing all that stuff, and and it just not, was not working out. And and yet, it, it, the funny thing about the, even Boone and Crockett in Boone and Crockett, you know, you can't use communication devices uh, to kill a deer. You can't enter it. So. Um, they could have shot it with the rifle, <laughs> and it would have been legal for Boone and Crockett. But if I would have used a radio, it wouldn't be legal for Boone and Crockett. Yeah, exactly. I'm down there. But I anyway. was ready to shoot that thing with the bazooka well, or you, a drone you, uh, or whatever you whatever would well, get the job it, done. Well, you know, you ended it, up getting it done though. Well, yeah, but the, the, and uh, then uh, <laughs> well, ended up uh, that uh, Jay ended up killing a giant buck anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I remember it. The first time Randy went down there, they found a giant deer, which I ended up killing. And when we got to the ranch, Randy said, I found another deer. Or I, I kind of said, do you want us to hunt down here kind of out of the way for something else? And he's like, actually, we found a bigger deer. Go up there and hunt that other deer. And guys, I mean, it's 133 and six eights. And Randy basically served it up on a silver platter to me and gave it to me. Um, and I'm forever grateful for that. It was a great opportunity to hunt a deer. And he ended up getting his year, um, but that was th those were fun times. We had we had <laughs> lots of fun banter back and forth, and and um, you know we've we've had some good hunts, and that was certainly one of them. And uh, now Jay's going to serve a, a a ghoul's turkey on, a, on silver a silver platter because <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely a a a turkey hunting hunting failure, a turkey hunting wannabe. It's because you've never tried. Oh, I won't tell you about all the times <laughs> I tried. <laughs> People will lose all respect for me. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I really appreciate you spending time with us today and um, sharing some of your knowledge. And I can speak for a lot of guys out there, guys you don't even know how much uh, you've meant to the industry, uh, not only archery, but the hunting industry. And, you know, to have you this close as far as, you know, in my hometown, your hometown, and, and be able to 
over the years bounce things off you, not only hunting, but uh, lots of business advice. Uh, I remember when I was kind of first starting and and trying to make my way and stuff, talking to you about things, and there were just little things that you would say, and then watching how you do things with your own businesses. And um, R- Randy, you're in a bunch of different businesses. People don't even know, but you're very successful in the business world. And so not only from hunting, but business and you know family man and and being able to watch how you've lived your life it's just been a pleasure from from my standpoint and just want to thank you not only from from myself but for everybody else out there uh for what you've done for the hunting industry um and how professional and how classy that you've been able to perform and and at such a high level for such a long time and and very humble and and you know lots of humility uh whereas you know lots of people with half of half of the you know success that you've had would be a lot different person so i just want to thank you uh for being that person and and someone that i look up to uh, and i know lots of other people do as well Wow. As soon as this podcast is over, he's going to ask me for something. <laughs> that's, that's where this is going, you guys. <laughs> Buttering him up. <laughs> yeah. 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 Usually a familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we have to get a little more familiar. <laughs> Uh, well, I appreciate you having me on, Jay. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I've not been much of a, a uh, media kind of guy. Uh, uh, I don't listen to, you know, I don't watch the show as much. I don't listen to everything. But uh, I started listening to your podcast, and it's like, wow, there is some great information here. I mean, it's, uh, and it's fun because it's, it's like, I mean, hell, we're sitting here on my back porch. It's like, and that's what it's like. It's like two guys sitting in hunting camp. And a lot of these television shows that I've watched um, are so kind of canned I, yeah. I don't know i don't know what the right term is but um it, it doesn't seem authentic authentic that's the term and 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 uh when you're doing your podcast it's like you're sitting in camp talking to a guy and it's guys that ha- have information or insights or little tips um you know it's funny i i, I don't think i've listened to a podcast of yours because uh, I, and i i hand pick them i i pick you know the gould's turkeys one but you no, want <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, I, I'm, I never have, I hate to, I hate to burst your bubble, but I've never listened to one of your fishing podcasts or your turkey hunting podcast. But, you know, I listen to your elk hunting, your sheep hunting and your, your deer hunting. And you always have someone on there that knows a little bit more or, than I do about certain things. And I don't think there's been one of your podcasts where I haven't, you know, taken a note and thought, you know, I got a, or a mental note and said, I got to do this. I got to do that. The thing that really bothers me, though, is is when I listen to your like podcast about equipment. <laughs> it always costs me money. Yeah, because <laughs> Jay's always at the cutting edge of of things, and and uh, when you, you know there's a, something new that's out there, I'm I'm kind of a I'm kind of a, a I like to junkie. I like to own a lot of gear. I and then when I actually go hunting, I'm a well when I go hunting in the high country, I'm a minimalist. But you don't know, I mean, I probably own 20 tents, just yeah. trying to get that next one that's the best thing. So, you know, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've learned a lot and spent a lot because of your podcast. So keep up the good work. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been awesome, buddy. Uh, I'm petting an was Australian Shepherd Austra- here. That's Max. Max, is, if you've heard some panting or anything over the podcast, this is our buddy Max here has been... Hanging and out with us on the podcast. Jay's, Jay's uh, definitely brought the wrong apparel. Max is white. He's a <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's a blue merles with the color you call it. Beautiful. But uh, uh, Jay's wearing a, a, what started out as a black shirt. <laughs> 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 now it looks like a fan and cheap. <laughs> well, buddy, thanks a lot. And, you bet. Uh, enjoyed it. <laughs>